now. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining. Uh, it, this, this is the first seminar of uh, this uh, new initiative that we are trying to kind of, uh, test if it uh, uh, this kind of ends up being useful to everyone who participates. Um, so it's basically going to be an online seminar series on uh, tensor networks with applications inclined towards high energy physics. Uh, but there will always be some room to make some adjustments as we go. Um, so, um, so I just want to make a couple of uh, uh, comments about using the microphone first. So uh, by default, everyone's microphone is uh, muted. This is to cancel out some background noise that you can sometimes get. This is just from past experience. But if you have if you have a question or if you want to make a comment, um, please turn on your microphone and go for it. Uh, but then after you've asked your question, turn it back off. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we really hope this initiative can be uh, can can kind of take off and become a bit, bit more of a regular thing and also maybe somewhat fun. Uh, a fun thing to do. Uh, all right, so without further ado, let me, uh, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to have Ignacio open the series. And of course, uh, Ignacio doesn't need any introduction whatsoever. Uh, so today he'll be telling us about uh, tensor networks and lattice gauge theories. Uh, so Ignacio, please uh, take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much for this mic. Great pleasure to be here and to open this seminar series. So let me first thank the organizers of this seminar series. And also, I think that that's a, that's a great initiative. So I hope that in the future, many conferences of this kind appear and this would save us some trips and also would uh, save a little bit of pollution in the environment. So I agree that this is, this is the future for me. And in fact, I guess that the technology will improve better and better so that at some point it would be as if we would be sitting in the next in the next room just sharing blackboards or whiteboards or whatever and just, uh, I think that that's a, that's a great initiative. Okay anyway so I want to give some kind of uh, introductory talk about tensor networks in higher energy physics and in particular lattice gauge theories and uh, so that's uh, I will uh, mention some of the work that we did in the past and many other people did in the past and but the ones that were involved in the things that I would particularly emphasize are, first of all, Marie Carmen Banyuls, and you all know her. And so she's leading our initiative here on tensor networks and connections to lattice gauge series. Uh, also, Eris Soar, who was uh, in our department for many years. Now he's back in Jerusalem. And so he was also responsible of many of the things that we were doing, not only with tensor networks, but also in quantum simulations of high energy physics. And also Antoine Tilloy, so who with him, I mean, we started also working together some things about going from the discrete to the continuum in tensor networks in higher dimensions. And then there are many other people that have contributed, and I have a list here, uh, Julian Bender, actually his name is misspelled here, and Michele Borrello, Patrick Emmons, Ida Kuhl, Andras Molnar, and Toste Lebo, and some other people that will appear in the, in the transparencies. Okay, so let me just first start to, uh, with something that is general, that's a perspective of the field. So we have seen in the last years that uh, actually there is a very close connection between many fields in, in, in quantum physics. And in particular in quantum information, from the beginning we saw that there were many connections with the field of quantum many body physics. And this, have come, this has uh, some impact in the, in the research in complex metaphysics, but during the last years we have seen more and more connections also with high energy physics and even with, with quantum gravity and some other fields. So I think that it's a great time in which now different languages are combined in order to attack uh, problems from different perspectives and just summing coherently all these initiatives can lead us to a progress in, in many directions. So not only, let's say, in lattice QCD because we use tensor network methods, but also in quantum information because we learn from lattice QCD. And in particular, so in the field of quantum information, one natural question that comes up is uh, when you have a, a quantum many body system, is how much entanglement is, is there. So for example, um, uh, in quantum information theory, you're interested in describing how a quantum computer works. And you would like to know whether a quantum computer really has more power than a classical computer. 
And this is why you typically ask, so if, if I'm running a quantum algorithm, do, do I need a lot of entanglement in this quantum computer in order to, to solve the problem with my quantum algorithm? Because in the extreme in which I would not need any entanglement at all, then I could just uh, describe classically the evolution of my quantum computer because it would be always in a product state and the effort to describe uh, product states grows only linearly with the size of the system, not exponentially. And therefore, we could simulate efficiently a quantum computer with a classical computer if it had no entanglement. And uh, so if we have a little bit of entanglement, and, and then it would mean that maybe there is also a, a good description uh, of a quantum computer. And so that are the typical questions that people were asking in the 90s and the beginning of 2000 in quantum information theory. So to develop a theory of entanglement and to apply it to many body systems, ask questions of how entangled are these systems, and depending on the amount of entanglement they had, so maybe find ways of, at that time, showing that the quantum computer was not that powerful. So now we can also export these sort of questions and this perspective now beyond quantum computing, but in general to many body physics. And so if somebody tells me that has a pure state or a mixed state or whatever, then I can ask, so is your pure state or your mixed state uh, very entangled or is a little entangled? And if it's very little entanglement, then we can learn something from that because we can learn that maybe we can, we can uh, efficiently describe it and find maybe some numerical algorithms to, to describe it. And actually, it turns out that indeed it is, is true that if you have now local, system, local interactions, so you have a quantum system in a lattice and with local interactions, and you ask, so if I have a thermal equilibrium state or in particular the ground state, of this uh, Hamiltonian with local interactions, then it turns out that this ground state has very little entanglement as compared as to what it could have. And uh, that's what, what, I mean, technically we, we say that it fulfills an area law, meaning that if you take just a piece of your system, a region of your system, and you compute the entanglement of this piece of your system with the rest, it only grows with the perimeter of, your, uh, of this region and not with the volume. So typically entanglement, as you know, is, 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 is an extensive quantity. So one would expect that generally you it would scale with the volume of your system. However, if you have local interactions and you're in thermal equilibrium, then it turns out that it only scales with the perimeter and therefore it has very little entanglement. So we say that it fulfills an area law. And the fact that this fulfills an area law means that maybe we can uh, describe it more efficiently than rather than to than than, than in the in, in the obvious way. You know, I mean, this state is a many body quantum state. Then the Hilbert space grows. The dimension of the Hilbert space grows exponentially with the number of particles or the number of lattice size that you have. Therefore, this requires some exponential uh, resources in order to describe it. But if we have little entanglement, maybe we can do it with only polynomial resources and therefore have an efficient description for many body systems. So as I'm saying. That's the perspective from quantum information. And once we know that there is this area law in, in, in systems with local interactions, then we can say, so what, how can then we use the fact that it has little entanglement to describe the systems? And that's where tensor networks come about. And the basic idea is that if you now have, let's say that we have a, a lattice system and you have a, each of the lattice size as a associated Hilbert space of dimension D, this is small d, that is here, then the total Hilbert space would be d to the power n, so it will scale exponentially with the number of sides that you have in your system. And so you, naively, you have a quantum many-body state of that system that you will write it in the basis, for example, in the computational basis, in the product basis, and then the coefficients that are in front, these coefficients here, will depend on all possible configurations, so there will be an exponential number of parameters. But now the fact that we have uh, and this is, this is the exponential effort, the exponential resources that we have to use. But if we know that we have little entanglement, then it turns out that it's possible to write all these coefficients, these exponential number of coefficients, in a simpler way, just by using uh, small tensors. In this case, the state, I mean, this, this complex coefficient psi that depends on these indices as one percent, you know, could be written maybe as a, as a, uh, in terms of these tensors A, B, C, and each of them, as you see, would have very few uh, indices. And so you will have, of course, the indices corresponding to the configuration that you have here, but some extra indices, like the ones that are done here, that are contracted. And the, the point is that instead of having to compute all these, let's say, all these coefficients, then you can compute and work with small 
tensors that have very few coefficients, and this is where you gain, and this is where you have the big advantage in using tensor networks. So typically, when we work on tensor networks and we use these small tensors in order to describe these huge Hilbert spaces, we don't write formulas, we use a graphical representation, and that's what is shown here. And so we represent now these coefficients, uh, these complex coefficients that can be considered as a, as a tensor with different indices. We, we, we describe in terms of a block that has different legs going out, and they, each of the legs corresponds to one of these physical indices. Of the, of the configuration of your system. And now writing it in terms of tensor networks means that we can have smaller tensors that have very few indices, each of them. So this is, for example, rank four. And they are contracted according to these auxiliary indices, which are some extra indices that we add. And what it means is that if we would just do this mathematical contraction of all these tensors, then we will obtain this tensor here, but the, again, the, the advantage is that we have very little tensor and that we never perform this contraction. So we'll never, we, we work with these tensors directly and not with this big tensor. We never construct it. We know that they are the same, but we never construct it because this is what requires an exponential effort and we don't do science. So the whole art of tensor networks is to be able to formulate physics in terms of small tensors, these small tensors, and to be able to compute expectation values, to make predictions, physical predictions, never resorting to these big tensors, but rather in terms of these small tensors here. So actually, there are many famous tensor network states. So the most famous are the matrix product state. We have this one dimensional geometry in which you have like one tensor with three indices. One is the physical index and the other ones are these extra indices that we have and they are contracted. And so, I mean, mathematically, we can write this relation between this, uh, all these complex coefficients in a basis in terms of a trace of a product matrix. So you fix the value of this index here and this index and this index, and what you see is that you have rank two tensors that have to be contracted, and contraction of rank two tensors is the same thing as matrix multiplication, and this is why it can be written, these coefficients in terms of, of traces of product of matrices, and that gave the name of matrix product state to these to uh, tensor networks, and they typically describe very well one-dimensional systems. We can do the same thing in higher dimensions, in which now each of the tensors have more indices, have the physical index, this is the rib index, and then it has these auxiliary indices that we add, and they correspond to as many as the coordination number of your lattice. And with this is how we approximate these many body systems, but I mean, take into account that now this, we can not only work with spins or finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but we could also work with fermionic systems, in which case, these tensors here, instead of being made out of numbers, are made out of Grassmann variables, but we can compute them very efficiently, so there's no problem. We can also work with bosonic systems. We can have different geometries. We can have one dimension, two dimensions, but we can have hyperbolic geometries. We can have uh, any, any lattice of any kind. We can have not only the description of, of states of the Hilbert space, but also operators acting on Hilbert space or maps linear maps acting on Hilbert space. And this gives rise to a lot of research during the last years of how to describe many body systems using this language, but also how to apply them to particular problems, so how to solve problems that are difficult with other methods with this method here. And also, a more fundamental question is how, if I give you one of these tensors, and so how to extract the physical properties of the many body, of the many body system. Anyway, so what I want to to talk about here is about the now these tensor networks, but related to high energy physics problems as they appear in lattice gauge theories. So I will talk first about something simple. So given a tensor network, how do we make sure that it can describe a lattice gauge theory? And we know that the lattice gauge theory has gauge symmetries, has local gauge symmetry. So how do we make sure that our tensor networks are in the right part of the Hilbert space that is constrained by, by Gauss laws or, or, or whatever is related to this? local symmetries. Then I move on to talk about tensor networks and Monte Carlo, so how we hope to go to higher dimensions, so to extend the methods of tensor networks now from one plus one dimension to two plus one dimension and hopefully to three plus one dimensions. Then I'll tell you something that uh, I find interesting on its own. It's maybe not so much related to tensor networks, but it's definitely motivated by tensor networks, is how you can get rid of fermionic degrees of freedom in lattice gauge theories. So typically in lattice gauge theories, we have matter described by fermionic degrees of freedom and 
gauge bosons, so described by bosonic degrees of freedom, and it's possible in lattice gauge theories using the fact that you have all these symmetries to find a unitary transformation which gets rid of the boson of the, of the fermions, and at the end you end up with a bosonic theory. There are only bosons, and it's unitarily equivalent to the original one, so you can make all predictions just using bosons, and this, as I mentioned, may have some interest beyond potential networks. And finally, I will talk a little bit of about how to go to the continuum. So, I mean, in this lattice gauge theories, so one possibility is to, if you want to describe some high energy physics model is to take the, the lattice, uh, I mean, make, take a lattice system, make bigger and bigger system, I mean, change your coupling constants in such a way that you can take the continuum limits and the normalization procedure included. But maybe another possibility is to work directly in the continuum. And then you will not have to, 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 to do this extrapolation to the continuum because you will still have to do some renormalization. But it seems that tensor networks provide with a method of doing this renormalization just by including more and more, let's say, very easy. So we'll talk a, li a little bit about that. Okay, so let me start about uh, gauging tensor networks. And I will use here the approach that we had in this paper here, together with Frank and Norbert. And, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, also, they have to say that there are many works in this context. You have them done there. Many people have had have made contributions, which have maybe different language, but they're very similar in content. Okay, so let's go now to lattice gauge theories. And so from now on, I will form, use a, a Hamiltonian formulation. So for people uh, in high energy physics, that's not so that's not so common, but it's a, maybe one of the best ways of making connection to tensor networks is just to not to work with actions and path integrals, but to work directly with a Hamiltonian formulation. And this was done many years ago by many people, among them Kovitz and Saskin, which tells you that if you have a lattice gauge series, then uh, maybe you can you can you can write it now in a Hamiltonian formulation, in which now you will have a lattice sites in which the vertices were all occupied by the by, by fermions. So the fermionic degrees of freedom will be in the vertices of your lattice and your gauge bosons will be these green particles here, will be in the links, degrees of freedom. And actually you can write the Hamiltonian and say, for example, if you are at zero temperature, then you would be in the ground state of this Hamiltonian. And this description will give you the prediction for observables or whatever, which will be exactly the same as you would use the path integral formulation. But as I mentioned before, that's similar. So we fix time. The time is uh, it's, it's, it's stopped, and and then you look, just look at ground states of Hamiltonians with this with this language. And so a tensor network. What we would like to do is to describe a state for this lattice system. So there would be two kind of degrees of freedom: the ones that live in the vertices that correspond to fermionic degrees of freedom, and the ones that live in the in the edges that correspond to bosonic degrees of freedom. So this would look like something like that, a quantum state, so the ground state of the Kagit code asking Hamiltonian for any particular gauge theory would look like something like that. It would be a tensor network, which will have two kinds of tensors. It will have these blue tensors that would correspond to the fermionic degrees of freedom that would be at the vertices of the lattice. And they will have the green tensors, which would be the gauge uh, bosons degrees of freedom. And see, well, some of them will have the, the ones in the in the vertices then will have more in, uh, auxiliary indices because they are the vertices, whereas the ones that are at the edges will have less degrees of freedom in the auxiliary degrees of freedom because they are at the edges. And hopefully, if you give me just yes, the blue tensor and the green tensor, and I just style it on the on the lattice as it's schematized here, and I would contract it, and then would give the ground state of the Hamiltonian corresponding to your lattice. So, but as we know, in lattice gauge theory, an important ingredient is that you have some gauge symmetry, which in this context means that if you apply a unitary transformation to one of these crosses that includes the bosonic degrees of freedom around the, the cross plus the fermionic degrees of freedom, then the state is invariant. And so this is a local symmetry because it should happen independently at each of the crosses of your, of your uh, lattice. So how do we make sure, how do we select these tensors in such a way that we have this, um, this symmetry in our system, this local symmetry. And so that's what I want to talk about. So how to do this choice, how to perform this choice in practice. And so here is more explicit what I meant before. So what it means that you have some uh, gauge symmetry is that you will have now some unitary transformation acting on your physical degrees of freedom of the, of the 
fermions here and of the gauge bosons, probably mis misspelled here something, uh, corresponding to some gauge group. Okay, so you have a uh, representation on the matter degrees of freedom and in the bosonic degrees of freedom that acting on the plaquette live invariant your state not for any element of your group. And this is represented in the tensor network language like that. So we have our tensor network state and if we apply to this plaquette here some unitary transformation to the physical index of the matter and some unitary transformation also to the physical index of the gauge fields, then the state should be invariant. So how do we make sure that if, or how do we choose the tensors, the blue tensors and green tensors in such a way that this is automatically true, that we don't have to take care about that. And actually, uh, that enters, in order to solve this question, then you can use of what is called the fundamental theorem of tensor networks, which generally uh, try to answer the following question. If I have a set of tensors that generate the state by Tens I mean, by building the tensor network state, generate state just by tiling and contracting. And I have different set of tensors that when you tile and you generate the state, it's exactly the same state. So you have two tensors generating the same state. What is the relation between these tensors? And you can see that this is exactly the question that we have here. We have the tensor, the green with the U, the blue with the U, the blue with the U, and the other ones without the U, that generate the same state as the ones without the U's, like the ones that are here. Okay, so this is an equality. We have two kinds of tensors that generate the same state. So when, what are the conditions then on these tensors? This is what is solved by this fundamental theorem. And so let me first show you what is the idea in one dimension to understand how to answer this question. So in one dimension, we have the same situation as before, but now it's simple. And what we assume is that we have, so we have one special dimension. Imagine that we have again a gauge group, and then whenever we apply this U to this physical index and of the, of the matter, the use of freedom, this U, to the auxiliary indices, we leave the tensor invariant, then the solution, if you apply this fundamental theorem, is that these tensors will have to have the following property. So this red tensor, when you apply the U, should be equal to, should remain invariant up to some transformation that you apply to the left index and another transformation that you apply to the right index. Whereas the green tensor, when you apply the U to the left, then it should be the same as if you apply some other operator to the right, which actually has to be the inverse of this one here. And the same thing should happen if you apply now the U right, so the right representation, uh, that should just expel somehow this operator on the left. And you can see that if your tensors, if this tensor and these tensors fulfill these conditions, these two conditions that I have here, then automatically you have an equality. Why? Because when I apply this U here, then there will be an X coming here and a Y coming here. That's this, what this relation says. On the other hand, this U, when I apply it here, there will be an X minus one going to the right, which will cancel the X. So there will be a cancellation. And when I apply this U here, there will be an Y that uh, acting on the left, which will cancel the Y minus one from this one here. So the state will remain invariant, which is what we want. So it's very clear that if you have these conditions, then you will have a gauge invariant state. What is more difficult, and that's why the fundamental theorem is very powerful, is that the other direction is also true, that that's the only possibility. So you have this condition, then it must be that your tensors have to fulfill these conditions. And this completely characterize, characterizes how the tensors building a gauge theory should be in one dimension. Now you have two dimensions, and then you can think of something similar. So what should happen then is that when you apply the U to the physical index, then there should be four operators coming out. And when you apply the U to the physical index of the bosonic degrees of freedom, then what comes from the left and to the right should cancel these operators here. And, uh, and actually, that's a, that's a sufficient condition, but nobody has proven yet that that's a necessary condition. So in fact, we believe that then under certain, maybe certain conditions of the tensors, this would be the full characterization of all the tensors that describe lattice gauge theories. As I mentioned, I mean, this is not proof, but we believe that probably with uh, some work that is written here, some very general uh, 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 proof of the fundamental theorem going to more than one dimension, then we will be able to attack this case. But anyway, so let's, let's assume that this is the only case. So that this is really, that this is a prescription of how to choose our tensors with the tensor network in such a way that they keep a gauge symmetry. So the idea is that the U should fulfill this property, sorry, that the, that the blue tensor should fulfill this property and the green tensor should fulfill this property for some Bs. 
here or BD and be direct. I mean, actually, it could be different, but anyway. And so then we assure that the tensors uh, represent a state that has this symmetry, that's invariant and there's these local symmetries. Actually, this also motivates now a way of building tensor networks that have these gauge symmetries in order to attack problems in lattice gauge theories. And this comes from the fact that indeed, if you have this property that I mentioned before, imagine that you have the tensor that fulfill these two properties, then if I build a tensor network only including the matter degrees of freedom, so I just take the blue tensors and put them together without the green tensors, then automatically, because I have this property, then you get that you have to have a global symmetry. So you apply the U, the U, the U, the U, the U everywhere, then you see that using these properties, all the Vs that are in the auxiliary index will cancel each other, so the state will be invariant. So in other words, this tensor network construction of gauge symmetries tells you that if you would ignore the gauge degrees of freedom, then you will have a global symmetry. And this, of course, reminds us very much so what happens in the standard constructions of high energy physics systems that actually what you do the other way around and can also inspire now how to build tensor networks. So what we can do, and we're reminding in, in, in typically in, in, in in gauge theories, the, the, the way that they arise is that you have certain Hamiltonian only for matter that it has a global symmetry. So you apply a U, it remains invariant. And then you promote this global symmetry to a local symmetry by introducing extra bosonic degrees of freedom. So what you do is to I mean, just have a new Hamiltonian now, so minimal coupling or whatever, in such a way that now you have, apart from your matter, you have this extra degree of freedom to get to promote the symmetry. And they make sure that now the Hamiltonian H, including this bosonic degrees of freedom, has a local symmetry. Only if you are on a plaquette, it will have this symmetry. So before it was that acting on the whole system, you have a symmetry. And now if you add this bosonic degrees of freedom acting on a plaquette, then you have the gauge symmetry. And there's a way of understanding so how you introduce gauge symmetries, knowing well, why do you need gauge fields in order to keep local symmetries. So we can do now exactly the same thing with tensor networks, just reversing what I explained you before. So we can start with a state only for matter that has a global symmetry, for example, U1 symmetry or SU2 symmetry or SU3 symmetry. And once we build the tensors like that, just imposing the symmetry, then we can promote the symmetry to gauge just by including the integrity of rhythm, the gauge bosons, which would be this green tensors having this other property that we put in the, in the, in the middle. And in this way, we make sure that our theory will be gauge invariant. So it gives you a systematic way of building gauge theories. And actually, that's something that we did some, some, some year ago, together with Trosten, Bar, Michele Burello, and Elis Soar. Namely, what we did is we said, OK, let's construct using this trick the simplest tensor networks. The tensor networks that have the lowest non-trivial uh, auxiliary dimension, what we call bond dimension. And now, that are, that are for matter and for gauge fields that are uh, invariant. And let's parameterize all possible tensors that also have rotational symmetry. So that if you rotate in a square lattice in two dimensions uh, by 90 degrees, plus one dimension by 90 degrees, then that the state remains invariant. So actually, you, there, there are a few parameters that characterize all possible tensors. And now what you can take is this tensor in two plus one dimensions and look at the physical properties. So you can just look at, uh, for example, if uh, um, some expectation values of uh, some gauge uh, invariant observables, or Wilson loops or whatever. And with that, so we found some phase diagrams. And so this for these toy models, and we were able to solve them very easily. Oops. And, and uh, so we choose a U1 model and SU2 model, and we found some phase diagrams. So I don't want to talk about the, the physics here, but just to tell you that in this phase diagram, we find different regions, and some of them include confinement, deconfinement, screening, and so on. So we find that even with the tensor networks that are very simple, with very small bond dimension, they capture already some physics that we expect in high energy physics. Of course, the challenge here is to maybe go to three plus one dimension and also to take not toy models, but to take real Hamiltonians, I mean, take, let's say, QED or QCD, Young Mills theory, whatever, and to do this exercise now with taking more complex tensors and using a, the tensors of variational theory. And that's, that's actually, I mean, that's something that in principle one can do, and people are trying to do that. But uh, 
I mean, this will be difficult, but there is an alternative approach that we are trying, and that's what I want to talk about now. And this brings me to ways of measuring, of, of, of mixing tensor networks and Monte Carlo. That's a paper that we published last year together with Eres. And let me tell you what is the idea. Okay, so let me go back to the construction of tensor networks that have uh, these gauge symmetries. So we start with a tensor network describing matter only that has a global symmetry. And then we include now these other tensors to promote this global symmetry to a gauge symmetry. And this is what I did before. However, there is another ingredient here that is somehow missing that it's used in high energy physics. And namely is that the states that you use in matter are not whatever state. They're very, very, very particular ones. So when you build out of, when you build QED, then, or QCD, then actually the free matter that you gauge is, uh, uh, sorry, the, the fermionic matter that you gauge, actually they are free fermions. So they don't correspond to interacting fermions, something, so they are free fermions and they will get the interactions with the, to the coupling to the bosonic field. So you start with a free fermion theory and then you gauge it and then you get the interacting um, bosons. And now what you can do is the same thing to include in what I said before, this uh, fact that the fermionic matter is not an arbitrary state. The ones that we start with is not an arbitrary state, but it corresponds to free fermions. And so for that, we can use, for example, something that we introduced and also Tifre and Jens Eisert and some other people introduced uh, in 2010, namely what are fermionic, fermionic states and in, in fermionic Gaussian states with global symmetries. And so in fact, it is possible now to choose these tensors in, in, in which in language, in, 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 in uh, 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 fermionic language, I mean, this could be written, these tensors, in terms of creation and annihilation operators for fermions acting on ill or all of the spaces of these fermionic spaces, the auxiliary one and the, and the physical ones, but in such a way that these are created out of the vacuum with some Gaussian operator, namely that these tensors that we put here are Gaussian, so it can be written as an exponential or something that which is quadratic in terms of creation and inhalation operators. These are called Gaussian states. And if we start with Gaussian states for the fermions that put here, and then we contract them as before, then this would correspond to a fermionic theory, a free, a free fermion theory. And that's a way of imposing some extra condition on the fermions that we have. And this would correspond to what people do that say in high energy physics that you start with free fermionic theories. And if we do that, then we can do now the gauge symmetry, uh, the gauge uh, procedure, but again, insist, I'm insisting on that by choosing these matter fermions, special ones, the ones that correspond to free fermionic theories, do the gauge theories, and then we will have we will have a tensor network state, and it turns out that you can build it, and we build it, and actually, in the examples that I showed you before, that's the way that we did it. We didn't think at the time that we were doing it with uh, free fermions that that's what we should do. But it turns out that if you do that, then you find that the states that you are that you are writing can be written is in this compact way. So let's forget about tensor networks for the moment. But the, the state, the global state, the tensor network state, can be written in terms of the uh, fermionic degrees of freedom, the gauge field degrees of freedom, and it's written as in terms of a, something that looks like at a path integral. That's just notation. So what this formula means is that you can uh, you can uh, 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 fix the degrees of freedom. So you, for, for example, put here some uh, degree, uh, I mean, some, some state, some quantum state, some quantum state, some quantum state, some quantum state, different quantum states at different degrees of freedom. And these quantum states are characterized by some quantum numbers, which are what this phi represents here. And so you can write your state, of course, always, you can write as a linear superposition of all these basic states for the gauge field plus some state now for the fermions that depends on these gauge fields. So this is a general way of writing a state. However, what turns out is that if you do it, this construction, then it turns out that the states that appear here in this superposition, they can be chosen to be fermionic Gaussian states. So they can be themselves, this many-body state can be written in terms of fermionic creation operators, operators 
than in, in, a Gaussian, in a Gaussian fashion. And this automatically means that actually that's something that you can compute very efficiently. So you have a state like that and you want to compute the expectation value of, of, of some observable, like this observable here. And let's take the simplest case that it only de 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 depends on the gauge degrees of freedom and is diagonal in this basis. Then you see that the expectation value using this formula would be just this kind of path integral in which you will have to compute these expectation values. But if you're able to compute these expectation values, well, and this, uh, this, this number square for each configuration, and you can compute this efficiently, then you can sample. I mean, because you say, yeah, this, I mean, everything except the A, all these things here can be interpreted as a probability density. And so you have here some expectation values with some probability density. So you just choose randomly the phi's, and then you can compute by using important sampling and so on, the techniques of, of metropolis or whatever, then you will be able to compute expectation values. And that's somehow the bottleneck of tensor network typically when we go to higher dimensions. That to compute expectation values, all the algorithms that we have scale very badly with the bond dimension. In two dimensions scale like the 10th power of the bond dimension. In three dimensions like the 18th power of the bond dimension that limits the, the, I mean, the, the possibility of using tensor networks in higher dimensions. However, as I'm saying here, if we do this construction, it turns out that we don't have to contract these tensor networks, but we can use Monte Carlo to compute expectation values. And here we will not have the sign, the sign problem in this description that we have here. And so that's actually something that we did in this paper with a toy example. So we took now a C3 uh, 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 gauge field. Like, so be, before I show you an example with IU1, so here we took a C3 because we wanted to have a finite dimension of the bosonic degrees of freedom. And we just look at some phase diagrams. So we parameterize also the states as before with parameters such that we keep the symmetries. And then we plotted a phase diagram and as a function of the parameters that parameterize all the possible states. But now instead of computing expectation values, we use Monte Carlo, for example. And this is the result. And the result you see that is very similar to the one that I showed you before, especially if you look at this corner. So it looks like, I mean, so this, this is plotting some observable, which shows that there are different phases. This is plotting another observable, which showing that some other phases. So you put, oh, I didn't see. so this is plotting one observable, that you see different phases, uh, the phase B, the, the phase A, and so on. This is plotting other observable, this just shows different phases. So you put together this and this, and make a phase diagram, and you see that you will see qualitatively the same phases as here. So we see that we reproduce the results that we had before, even with a C3 symmetry instead of a U1 symmetry. This gives us courage to now to uh, try to go to higher dimensions and also to go to more complicated systems and now to go to realistic Hamiltonians. And that's what Patrick is doing at the moment. So we're starting with gauge theories and then going to higher dimensions. And so that's a, an, a, a something that we're putting a lot of, of effort. So it would be a way of extending tensor network technique to higher dimensions with the possibility of just combining Monte Carlo and, and uh, tensor network techniques. It has a caveat, and this is what we have to explore, is that of course the, the tensor networks that we are building are not completely general because they correspond to this construction in which you start with three fermions. So it may happen that when we try to solve, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 some QCD Hamiltonian, then they don't get a good state because there are some particular subclass of PEPs. And that's why other approaches, like trying to contract these tensors in the normal way, I mean, may be powerful for, or complementary to this approach. Okay, so let me make a little bit of, of, a, of a break here. And uh, so I've been talking about tensor networks and lattice gauge theories, including matter and fields, and somehow the, the, the summary so far is that there is a systematic way of building tensor networks. And once you have the tensor network, then you can apply to specific problems. If you're in one dimension, so many people have applied them and been very successful. You apply to higher dimensions. The first efforts are being done now. And I told you a way of doing that, just combining Monte Carlo techniques that we are trying at the moment. We are also trying, so Daniel Rowan actually in, in, in our department is using uh, PEPs codes in order to this this contraction more in the standard way and also using some some, some techniques together with Claudio Zubik and Mari Carmen. But now I'm going to, to change a little bit topic 
And I'm going to talk about something that's a bit more weird, that is eliminating fermions. And let me tell you what, I, what it means and so how, somehow where is this idea coming from. So um, at the beginning, I told you that that's a way of building, that's one way of building tensor network with gauge symmetry. So it's probably with a fundamental theorem will tell us that that's the, un the only way of doing that, but that's the way that we are using at the moment. And in one plus one, uh, in one plus one system, I mean, this is the only, the only way, that's what I show you. But in D plus one system, actually Borello and Soar, they took this idea and then they use a particular way of solving these equations. And now if you use the particular way in which they solve these equations for different groups, then what one realized is that actually it should be possible for the tensor networks built in this particular way to apply a unitary transformation acting on a plaquette that disentangles the fermionic degrees of freedom from the bosonic degrees of freedom. Okay, so again, so there is a particular, I mean, we don't know if this is the more general, I don't think that this is the more general, but the particular way of building tensor networks now explicitly it has this property that you can disentangle the, 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 the fermions locally. And at the beginning, we thought that that was a, a, a bug of this particular way of building tensor network. We thought, okay, so that's very bad because this means that, I mean, they have some property that probably is not happening in, in, in nature. I mean, why should you be able to disentangle the matter degrees of freedom in a, in a, in a gauge theory? But then we started thinking about that. And, 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 um, and so this, actually thought we, we thought that these effects were very constrained and constrived somehow. But then we thought that actually, that maybe this is true for lattice gauge theories in general, that it is possible to disentangle the fermions in a local degree of freedom, in, 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 in a local way. And so that's what I wanted to talk about. And let me tell you that indeed it is possible to do that. And so this has some consequences. And before discussing the technicalities, let me tell you what are the consequences. So for, the first one is that fermions are not required. So you could write, I mean, just taking uh, exaggerating, you could write the standard model only with bosons degrees of freedom. I mean, that could be, I mean, this is a consequence of that. Another consequence is that uh, you could use this technique for quantum computing. So as you know, in quantum computing, so people have been, many, many people, I guess, that will attend this series of talks, are thinking about how to use quantum computers in order to solve lattice gauge theory problems. And there, one of the issues is that the fermionic degrees of freedom, whenever you have fermionic degrees of freedom, then you have to translate in terms of qubits, and qubits are bosonic because they commute at different lattice sites. And so there is always some price that you have to pay. So you do it naively, there will be a Jordan Wigner transformation. So you have to add all these uh, strings of operators. I mean, uh, some people figure out ways of decreasing that. But actually, this tells you that actually you don't have to do anything like that. You just use this transformation, transforms into a, a, a bosonic theory. Actually, I forgot to tell that the bosonic theory that you get is local. So you have a local bosonic theory, and then you can represent without any, without any transformations and do quantum computations with, with that. This may also have interesting applications in analog quantum simulation because it tells you that now with some systems in which people are doing analog simulations that are bosonic in nature, then you could do also fermionic uh, computations. So for example, you think about trap ions, the trap ions, and then the degrees of freedom are the spin of the, of the atoms, but also the phonons. Uh, degrees of freedom in the motion of the ions, but these are bosonic degrees of freedom. So if I if you want to simulate a fermionic uh, theory or fermionic with gauge theory, so how can I encapsulate in, a, in an analog way in this system well, that says that we will have to simulate the bosonic one and you will not have to do anything else. And so that's, I think that there is, is this part here, which is uh, a bit more, I mean, there's a, a big question mark, so maybe I mean, the fact that you have bosonic theories may give you some other ideas of how to use Monte Carlo methods to, to, for the system. But I mean, that's, uh, as I'm saying, it's, a, it's, I mean, it's just uh, raising the question. It's not that we uh, hope or expect to have something in the direction. Okay, so let me go into the details. So how to do this in practice. And so I will use again the Kogut and Saskin formulation, which now I need a Hamiltonian because I'm talking now, I forget about tensor network that's general. So this is for a, for a Hamiltonian that has some of these local gauge symmetries. And so we have again, in any dimensions, the fermionic degrees of freedom, the bosonic degrees of freedom, and the Covent and Saskin formulation tells you that the whole Hamiltonian can be written in terms of three Hamiltonians. That acts only 
on the fermionic degrees of freedom on the matrix on the matrix so on each of these of these vertices so this is typically the one that corresponds to the mass terms of the of your theory of the you have a mass term in the fermion so maybe you don't have you don't don't have it then then there is one that corresponds to the Hamiltonian of the field so this acts on the, the green particles so these are the bosonic degrees of freedom and typically there are two terms there is one that contains the electric degrees of freedom in quotes that is acting the thing inside and the other one that is related to the magnetic energy that has plaquette interactions so this is this term here has some uh, single side and plaquette interactions and then there is the interaction an interaction is a term in which a fermion basically hops from one place to another one and interacts with the bosonic degrees of freedom that they reveal. So all these case theories can be written in this form. And the fact that they have a gauge symmetry means, that, as I mentioned before, that there is in each, in each of these crosses, there is a unitary transformation acting on these particles in the bosonic degrees of freedom and the fermionic degrees of freedom to lift the Hamiltonian invariant, the symmetry of your Hamiltonian in this language. Okay, so what, what we're going to do is we're going to build a unitary transformation Unitary transformation would, would be a product of unitary transformations, and each unit, each of these unitary transformations will act on a cor on a cross. So, will be a cross on a unitary transformation here, another acting here, another acting here, everywhere else. That even though they have some overlaps, they will commute, and so this is why it, it doesn't matter the order in which you write this product, and that they transform the Hamiltonian into some other Hamiltonian. And the new Hamiltonian, first of all, is local. The second, it doesn't have fermionic degrees of freedom, but har has hardcore bosons. And it's still a gauge theory, so it has gauge symmetries. And so let me tell you what is the idea behind that. So for that, what we are going to do is to, uh, well, I have to say that this is inspired by some work that uh, 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 I did together with Frank Strat many years ago, which, in which we did something related for Hubbard models. But here we use explicitly the fact that we have these gate symmetries and that's very important. Okay, so, so the first... Uh, Ignacio, I have a question. Yep. Uh, so, when you said that the final Hamiltonian also has a gate symmetry, what is the representation of the operators? They aren't local anymore or because... Yes, you know, they, are, they, they, they are local operators. So, they are still, so now, what will happen is that now these red particles would be like blue particles, would be hardcore bosons. And now the gauge symmetry would be still that there is a unitary operator acting on the, all these bosonic degrees of freedom now because they are all bosons that keeps the Hamiltonian H prime invariant. Okay. All right. So you have at the end a local Hamiltonian where there are no fermions, they are replaced by hardcore bosons, but you still has is a gauge theory meaning that there are some local gauge symmetries. And they actually, as I will mention, will be the same as the one that we had before, maybe with an extra symmetry. Okay. But let me let me so is there any other question at this point? Okay, I understand there's no, so I continue. Okay, so for that, I I mean this this one of these plaquettes, and you have the red, these are the fermionic degrees of freedom, the green, these are the bosonic degrees of freedom, and now I'm putting more balls here. So these are new degrees of freedom that I'm going to put around each of these crosses. And so there will be two kinds of fermions, what I call the type one fermions that I'm adding. And I will tell you what I mean by adding type one fermions, but they're going to be Dirac fermions. And type two fermions, these are the blue, which are Majorana fermions. And so, and okay, so the first step in this construction is to add these new degrees of freedom. And now you, what you do is with these degrees of freedom, you build composite modes. Okay, so first you take the, the, uh, these Dirac fermions, these yellow particles, and you define a Majorana operator, like C plus C dagger, right? With this, with this fermion degree of freedom. And then you combine the yellow, so two fermions, the yellow fermion and the, and the red fermion, the original fermion, you combine into a new operator. And this has now, since it's a product, this would be like a bosonic degree of freedom because there are two fermionic operators. So it will commute now with elements of this kind that are somewhere else. Okay, so you build with the, X, with the auxiliary fermions that you add and the old fermion, you build a new kind of particles that are here. And on the other hand, you take, you see, the blue fermions that you had on one plaquette, for example, the one that is on the right, and you combine it with the one that you have in the next plaquette to the left, 
And out of these two Majorana modes, you make a real fermion. So you can bind, you define a create an annihilation operator, which would be just this mode plus I times this mode operator. And so now there is these two Majorana modes made out of one fermionic mode, which is this F, and these two fermionic modes uh, made one bosonic mode. So the original Hilbert space, now we can define, I didn't define the, the, the Hilbert space for the moment, but now we can define the Hilbert space. So the Hilbert space that we have is the original one for the original fermions and the bosonic degrees of freedom, plus the Hilbert space for the yellow particles, plus the Hilbert space for the blue particles. And actually, we, uh, we take as a Hilbert space... The I have a question. Yep. Is it possible? Uh, so, uh, from the original Dirac fermions, the C, yes. you can construct two Majorana modes, right? Yes, yes, but I only const I only need one. And so the other one, what happened to it? The other one, I mean, doesn't doesn't enter in the discussion, so it will not appear. You will see that it will it, it will, will factorize. So I could have started actually with the Xi. So I could have started my construction, okay. including some Majorana fermion. Okay. But it turns out that for some intermediate steps that I will skip here anyway. I will, I will, I will need the fact that they are real fermions. But you could think that I have this psi directly, okay, this Majorana fermion, and I build this fermion here. Okay, thanks. You see, so my Hilbert space now I can construct is the original one, and then I put two trivial Hilbert space for the auxiliary particles. So for the C particles, I put them in the global vacuum. So this is the vacuum that is annihilating by all the C operators, by all the just, uh, yellow operators, and then for the for these uh, blue particles, then I define it in terms of Majorana. So defining the vacuum for the Majorana is not op it's not it's, it's ambiguous. However, since I have built now fermionic operators, standard Dirac fermionic operators, then I can define the vacuum. So I define this as the vacuum of these fermionic operators. Okay. So again, I have now my original system plus some other trivial degrees of freedom that I added in some particular way state that they are in the vacuum. So at the moment, I just have exactly the same dimension of the Hilbert space that I had at the beginning, because I have asked, uh, and I've, I just put a product state, which is here. Okay, so the next step is to identify electric parity operators. Okay, that's a little bit uh, um, more subtle. An idea is that in the interaction Hamiltonian that I mentioned before, that I told you that there is a hopping of one fermion that holds to the other side and interacts with the bosonic degrees of freedom. So typically, the interaction looks something like that. There is an annihilation operator on, on the right, as an operator on the right, on the left, and then there is an operator U that is acting on this fermionic degrees of freedom, on this bosonic degrees of freedom, this U operator. And so now what we look is for some operator that we call parity operator, that we write it like that. So it's, a, it's an operator that squares it to itself, so it's idempotent, such that it anti-commutes with this U. Okay, some operator that p times u plus u times p is equal to zero. And so in this language, if I write any then potent operator can be written as e to the i pi some e operator. If I write in this language, so it means I can write it that u times e to the i pi is equal to, to u, uh, sorry, e to uh, i pi times u is equal to u times e to the i p one plus one. So this one gives the minus sign from the anti commutator. So that's the condition that we asked. And in fact, it's very easy to see that if your gauge group is un or su to n, it always exists and you can construct explicitly. So we construct it in the paper. Now, in the case that you have something that is not sun, so for example, you have su3, then, I mean, you cannot apply this trick. There exists no operator that fulfills something like that. And then the way getting around, I will not explain it here, but there is a way in which you just put an at yet another degree of freedom here, yet another bosonic degree of freedom that is trivial, which has a C2 gauge symmetry, but I will skip that. Anyway, the fourth step is to define the unitary transformation that I told you before. So it's the unitary transformation is a product of local unitary transformation. So I have to define what is this local unitary transformation. And now it will be defined, is defined like here. So the unitary transformation that is acting on each of these vertices contains operators of everybody that is here, okay? So you see, it's a product of four operators. Let's say one would be related to the right, one to the left, one to the up, and one to the down, which are here. And it contains this xi that I defined before, which is from the yellow, the alpha that we had uh, before, the one corresponding to these particles that I'm adding, 
and the electric field, so the blue particles, the alpha, beta, gamma, the blue particles, so there's the yellow particle, the blue particle, and this E is an operator that is acting on this degree of freedom. And actually, this is the E that you have identified before. Okay, the E, as you said, we look for a parity operator, the E, you put the E that appears there up here. So this operator looks very weird, but it's not weird because you see this operator that is here, I, Xi, alpha, these are two Majorana operators. We know that this is a Hermitian operator and it has eigenvalues plus and minus one. So this is something like one to the power E to one or minus one to the power E1 and E1 takes integer value. So this is like an operator P that we had before basically. And each of them is like the operator P and each of them contains the right, the left and so on. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. And now we conjugate the Hamiltonian and our Hilbert space with this operator U, standard quantum mechanics when you do unitary transformation to change bases or whatever. So we do that. And so now, I mean, I'm not going to do it here, but what comes out is first of all, is the type two vacuum is unaffected. So in other words, you take the F operator, the F operator that was built here, you apply to any state on the Hilbert space that is transformed and it's annihilated, it gives zero. So it means that the new Hilbert space, the transform has to be the one corresponding to the physics plus the particles of type one and the type two is the vacuum. So somehow you're putting an ancilla there that doesn't do anything but helps you to do this transformation but at the end it stays in the vacuum. So it didn't do anything at all. It's, it's, it's funny because you put it and you have to put it back and you get it back. But I mean, that's, that's the auxiliary that plays a role of, and, uh, uh, and Silla, so it's, it's kind of catalyzing this transformation. And now the, 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 the Hamiltonian, what happens if you do this transformation in your Hamiltonian is this transform. So whenever you had a fermionic operator, now you have the operator eta. So this is the hardcore boson operator times e to the i e, like pi e, there is a pi missing, e to the i pi e here. So you see, of course, this is a fermionic operator. And now there is something that appears that is like a bosonic operator and there is a phase that appears there. And this is the one that takes care of the fermionic character. And apart from that, there appear terms in your Hamiltonian, which have the form F dagger F that commute with the Hamiltonian. So these degrees of freedom, actually, I mean, you see that they go away. So they cannot depend on these degrees of freedom. So these go away. And so they don't enter in your Hamiltonian anymore. So let me give you a hint of how this is happening and this mysterious change. So you see, what we have, remember, is this for the interaction term, we have this A dagger UA, that were the original one with the left and the right. And now we have to apply this set of unitary operators, many of operators like that to the right and the daggers to the left. So actually, there should be a plus here because they're mission. But anyway, so, and then you see, when you apply all these operators, just like take this one and this one here, then you can move this to the, to the left. But when you have to, to move it to the left, then you have to anti-commute it with the, or commute it with the U. But this is like the operator P. When you anti-commute or commute with the U, then the E goes to E plus one. So that's what I explained before. So now you have this operator and this operator, this is E plus one. So they, they cancel each other and there is only the first power that, uh, that appears because it's to the power two E. And so this uh, plus or minus one to the power two E cancels out. Now there is a power one. So there is only left I alpha Xi. And then you do it on the left, on the right, and everything. So you see that every time you will have some, some Xi appearing and some, some Xi, like it appears here, and the original A, and some Xi on the right and some A. And with this Xi times A, these are the two fermionic operators that made the eta. Then there would be still some, some uh, operators beta that appear here, this alpha that is here, they appear beta, but there will be some alpha from the left and something that will come from the other side. And this will give this F dagger F that commute with your Hamiltonian. And that's how at the end, everything appears. So I know that it's difficult to follow, but anyway, so I just want to say that the statement at the end is like by doing these transformations, then at the end, you have the fermionic so Hamiltonian is transformed into a bosonic Hamiltonian. And so since my time is up, so I had another topic that I wanted to mention here, which is how to build continuous tensor network for quantum field theory. And just to tell you that, I mean, it's very well known in one dimension of how to build continuous matrix product states. This basically what you have to do is to take matrix product states and do a renormalization procedure, but to the ultraviolet, and then you end up with some limits, this is the continuous limit, and in this way is that how you get continuous matrix product state. 
And if you try to do the same thing in two dimensions, then it turns out that it's not possible because this renormalization actually increases the bond and dimension. And so this means that every time if you want to keep the bond dimension, then you have to go from a bond dimension D to a square root of D. But if D is two, for example, then you cannot take a square root of integers and get something integer. So this means that this has to be infinite. And this is what we did. So we consider an infinite bond dimension. So we go to path integrals in terms of path integrals and solving some problems that uh, have appeared in the past and we were able to have some formulation. Of that. Okay, so summarizing. So my talk has been about uh, I mean, high energy physics models like they appear in lattice gauge series and tensor networks. I told you uh, what is a recipe to build uh, tensor networks with gauge symmetries. I told you that we have a recipe. To, it's not in higher dimensions than one. It's not yet proven that that's the only way of getting gauge symmetries from tensor networks. And that's something that probably can be proved with the fundamental theorem, but has not been proven so far. I told you about combining tensor networks with Monte Carlo. I think that this will allow to go to higher dimensions, two and three dimensions. It has a caveat that it's not as general as a tensor network because these are certain specific um, uh, states built like that. But we want to try, and we are trying the moment to see whether we can describe uh, physics. So it turns out that, I mean, from the, from the results that we had so far with ERES, it turns out that it can describe the physics of confinement, deconfinement, screening and so on. So we hope that it will have enough physics in, in such a way that it can describe the basic mechanisms in, in lattice gauge series. Then I told you about how to eliminate fermions in lattice gauge series, but not only in lattice gauge, well, in lattice gauge series, not only with tensor networks, but in general. And I briefly mentioned some continuous tensor networks. So these are the people who have been contributed to that and many other collaborators. So thank you for your attention. Thanks again for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, maybe I have a question. This is Carl. Huh? Oh, yes. Not, I, okay. I still don't get the magic of diseliminating the fermions. <laughs> when, when we do this um, in our Lagrangian setup, then we either we get a non-local interaction yeah. or we get um, many new degrees of freedom. So we have to introduce n bosonic fields, and then we can describe all this in a local gauge theory, bosonic gauge theory, but um, have to introduce a lot of degrees of freedom. So in your approach, you seem to avoid both of these um, phenomena. And yes. I don't get the magic. Do you have some intuition? Okay, so it's, it's, it's different. So in, in the way I understand uh, that you do usually is that you, uh, in the path integral, you integrate out the fermionic degrees of freedom because they appear in a Gaussian. So you have a Gaussian integral and then you can integrate them out. But they, but they, I mean, they, of course, that's very nice because you only have bosonic degrees of freedom, but then you get a non-local non -local, uh, Lagrangian no, in, in time. And this happens also in condensed matter that when you integrate out the degrees of freedom, then you get for the bosonic degrees of freedom something that is non-local in time. However, that's one approach. But in some cases, in some particular cases, it is possible not to integrate them out, but actually to uh, put some extra fermionic degrees of freedom, some kind of uh, trivial degrees of freedom that they, have any, not, they don't have any dynamics, and then to do a unitary transformation in such a way that somehow, uh, uh, I mean, first of all, disentangles the, the, the fermionic degrees of freedom. So now they are in a product state, and the price that you have to pay is that you, they, they are replaced now by some hard bosonic degrees of freedom. And that's exact. So there is no transformation. And the theory at the end is indeed has the same number of degrees of freedom as the original one, exactly the same. So it has still the gauge bosons. The, the, the degrees of freedom corresponding to the fermions are now hard, hardcore bosons. So they have the same dimensions of Hilbert spaces. And, 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 and the, the, I mean, the, the, where is the fermionic part left? So the part that is left in the Hamiltonian is that you get this exponentials of i pi electric fields and this gives five phases and so this is what remains somehow but these are in terms of bosonic degrees of freedom so i don't think that that's that's a, that's a, that's a magic is somehow the fact that if you have two fermions then you can create a boson so just put some extra fermions and not make, let's make a boson out of that and let's find, try to find the transformation that makes a boson and still keeps locality Okay, thank you. <laughs>
Are there any other questions? So if not, let's uh, thank Ignacio again. Can I, can I, can, can I ask you another oh, question? Maybe? I, I have a question also. I raised the hand, but it doesn't work. OK. <laughs> but uh, please, uh, you can't see what I had. OK, so um, do you really do Monte Carlo in your higher dimensional approach to solve this integral? Or you, I think we discussed this. You can use some more clever algorithms, right? Yeah. So for the moment, for the moment, uh, Patrick is using Monte Carlo, and so he's doing for a, a gauge series in two dimensions. So not including uh, 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 matter degrees of freedom. But for the moment, what we want to test is that we can go to higher one dimensions. I mean, so because if at the end uh, it turns out that we cannot go to one dimensions larger than let's say two, which is the one that we can nevertheless do typically by contracting tensors then the approach would not be that good. So we want to show that it's possible to go to higher dimensions with two dimensional systems, and maybe to, to go to three dimensions with higher dimensional system, with, with higher one dimension, sorry, three dimensions with three plus one. And once this, this works then, and, and we see that we observe the, the phenomena that we hope to observe, and I think that we will, I mean, the idea would be just to put effort and to try to use really good techniques to, to, to advance the field. So for the moment it's more exploratory to see whether we will, I mean, this, this, this trade-off that we have between restricting the set of PEPs, but being able to contract with Monte Carlo, whether this has a good description or not. That's at the moment what, what we're looking at. And we don't have definite results. I see, thank you. Uh, can I do a question? Can oh, I... Yes, please, Luca, go ahead. Uh, hi Ignacio. So I had a question. So it's clear to me that it's your approach is a kind of duality, you know, in which you transform one model into another. But it's not clear to me that even if the uh, final model doesn't have any fermions, it is uh, sign problem free. Can you? Right. No. That's ah, you're okay. really right. This is why okay. when I mention these consequences, right? So I say here, you see. There is uh, ah, okay. small, yes. but there's a question mark. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes, I <laughs> this is because it's not clear to, to us that it will be uh, sign-free. And the reason why it's not obviously sign-free is because there are these phase Phases. factors that depend on the gauge fields. Yes, I see. And this may add signs and would probably add signs. But nevertheless, I guess that would be, would be good to, I mean, to try to think about whether one can use directly Monte Carlo on those, on those models mm -hmm. and to see whether they, I mean, there is some regime or something where you get sign free because it's a different approach than the one that is used in in, in lattice gauge theories with path integrals with monte carlo and we know and this in from condensed matter physics we know very well that sometimes you try a certain approach with monte carlo and it has the same problem but you try another approach and doesn't have the same problem no? yes so it may happen that it complements that we don't know okay thanks okay any other questions All right, so let's uh, finally thank uh, Ignacio again. Uh, and, and I'll just uh, end with uh, two quick announcements. Uh, the first one is, uh, in case you've missed some of the details and would like to revisit the talk, uh, we can upload the talk on our YouTube channel. So the link was in the email that I sent. Uh, and uh, the last thing I want to say is that the, our current plan is to do this approximately once a month. Um, and we all already have the next to speakers uh, lined up. So next month on December 6th, uh, I believe, is Bartek Czech. And then in Jan, we kickstart the new year with Frank Bustade. And uh, then uh, I have, uh, I think Gifre is gonna make an appearance at some point as well, uh, early next year. But it's not, uh, there's no set dates yet. So yeah, that's all. So thanks, uh, thanks again uh, for joining and see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.